Hi, thank you very much for, for inviting me to this great conference. I'm enjoying it so far a lot, and I hope we will, we will have some great talks in the remaining of the day. Um, I'm going to be talking about web performance, but specifically about culture. Um, some of you might have seen lots of talks about how to improve web performance. We've been, we are going to be talking a bit more about how to foster uh, culture within your companies. Uh, hi, my name is Jose, and as Vitaly said, I'm working at Spotify. I'm a software engineer there, and that's my little daughter, who is my side project these days. <laughs> yeah, she's taking most of my time. I'm on parental leave, actually, and yeah, it's not vacation. I was told it was going to be great, and I, would, I could just uh, turn on the TV and put some cartoons there, but no, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's amazing. I like it. So we've been um, talking about web performance for a long time, and the people that have been reading about this might know the guy on the right. Um, that guy is Steve Souders, and he used to work at Yahoo. And he was very interested also in web performance and trying to reverse engineer what browsers were doing when loading the different assets. He's also one of the organizers of a web performance conference tool, uh, called Velocity. He came up with a list of rules, some kind of a checklist, um, for creating faster loading websites. And this was back in 2007. That's 11 years ago. And one of the interesting things is that he put a focus on, fr on front-end performance, not so much about the time it took for the back-end to generate the page, uh, which he calculated was around 10 to 20%. So he really realized that 80 to 90% of the time spent is on, on the front-end part, on loading those assets. These sets of rules um, include things like uh, making fewer HTTP requests or enabling GCP. And these were also the basis for some uh, automated tool like um, WiseLow, which was um, an extension that you could run against your page. So it would automate this. It would tell you, you are bad at rule 8. You should improve it like this or like that. So you don't need to go and do some manual testing. We have had these tools. And these days, we have way more complete and complex tools, like Lighthouse. This is a tool by Google, and you have it integrated on Google Developer Tools. And the last version, the latest version, was released during Google I.O. Uh, a couple of months ago. And this will give you even more metrics, like how good SEO is on your page, or how uh, good you are supporting progressive web apps. Even things like when your page starts rendering or when it becomes interactive. And specifically, I really like this second part of the report, which are very specific uh, tips for improving performance on your site. And it will tell you, by prefetching or preloading these assets, you are going to be able to save two seconds. Or by lazy loading these images that you have below the fold, you will be saving one second. So we have lots of tools, and we've been uh, addressing web performance for a long time, but we still see things like this. Like you go and you check, you use a, a website that is really slow, and as a web developer, I like to have a look at the network panel. I might right click and I might check what's going on, just to learn a bit. If you use one of these tools, it will tell you, yeah, you should improve it. So we still see lots of this, even though we know about web performance and we have the tools. So there's something else going on. And just for the sake of completeness, uh, Peter CSS does very good at this. So whoever worked on the website, um, kudos. So as I said, this is not a talk about why web performance is important. I think we, we quite agree that having sites that load fast and they are uh, smooth are going to be better, and are, they are going to drive key metrics up. This is more a talk about culture. And I think it's important to think a bit about the people that are here and the people that usually attend conferences and watch these talks, these videos. We might be representatives from, from our companies, right? We are coming here from um, the companies that we, we are working for. But the truth is that everything that we learn can't really be applied afterwards. Because when we go back to our teams, we have something like this. We have the daily job of going through an ever-growing backlog. 
And if you are like me and you care about performance, most likely the performance related tasks will be quite at the bottom of the backlog. And everything will be put uh, right in front of it. So you will never have time to work on that. And as developers and designers, we need to make trade-offs. There are like not everything has not everything can be as important as every other thing. So we need to be working on creating new features. We need to be supporting this uh, marketing team because they need to create some campaigns and they are telling us to add three third-party scripts to track everything. And we are like, no. And they say, okay, just add this Google Tag Manager and then we we can add everything there. And you're like, no, that's even worse. But you need to support those teams. You need to care about continuous integration, continuous deployment, security, uh, testing, UX, UI, accessibility, performance, everything. And everything seems to be important, right? But we don't have time for, for everything. The thing is that some of these are really, they're driven by people whose job, whose job is to drive those. So you might have a product owner or product manager telling you what features to implement. So their job is to optimize, their job is to prioritize that. You might have another team that needs your support, like the marketing team. So you need to support them. You might have a security team also telling you, we have a vulnerability and you need to fix this. But normally you don't have a performance team. And this actually reminds me of uh, the, the talks that we've seen this afternoon, uh, sorry, this morning about accessibility. It's also a bit up to the team to come up with how, how do we make this accessible. There's no, normally there's no team within your company that will tell you, you need to fix uh, accessibility or you need to fix performance and these are the tools that you need to use. Normally that's left up to the team, which makes it a, a bit difficult to balance between the things that are pushed by other people within the organization. And we suffer from being agile and putting things in front of users as early as possible. I think it's a good thing, um, but at the same time, we tend to leave performance for the, the perfect uh, side. So let's ship it, and then if it works, we will fix the performance. And I, I think performance should be thought a bit earlier. I think performance is a feature by itself. If you release something that the user wants, but it's slow as hell, that might also have an impact on the metrics that you are using to, to prove that the prototype works. So I would really like to move it a bit before. So I've been thinking about uh, different steps that we, we can start uh, working on for creating a performance culture, and I'm going to go through them. The first one is quite obvious. Um, your development, the development environment is not really your user's environment. Um, I, use, I use actually this laptop. I use it for, for work. And I have an iPhone X that I use as a personal device and also as the device that I use to browse mobile sites. And I have a high-speed connection and 4G pretty much everywhere, even, even inside the subway in, in Stockholm. That's not really representative of what people out there are using. And it's very difficult that we can optimize for those constraints. And we are building World Wide Web and not wealthy Western Web, as Bruce Lawson put it a couple of years ago. Um, in my daily job, I'm, I'm working in Spotify and we have users all over the world. And it's very easy to forget about those new users coming from emerging countries where you haven't really tested so much maybe your solution or your website. And then you realize that, oh god, they are using UC Browser, and we don't have anyone here that has used UC Browser in proxy mode, that is some kind of Opera Mini mode that doesn't support CSS3 gradients, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important that we, that we try to mimic what the users are using. So we need to be thinking about what devices they use, uh, what network connectivity are they using, or maybe they don't even have network at some point, and it's quite spotty. And also, uh, what browsers are they using? And speaking about browsers, it's very tempting to say, yeah, all of this sounds really good, but we can't really support everything. We need to set a line and say, uh, we are only going to support evergreen browsers, or we are going to support 
I11 and 8 and upwards. But where, where do we draw the line? Because users, we're still getting some users that can't use any other thing. And even though I would really like to, to think up in a different way and, and believe that they can install Chrome, there are lots of users that can't really install Chrome, either because they are in some working environment, and Spotify happens a lot that people use Spotify while they are working, or maybe because their <laughs> devices can't support that, or they don't have admin rights. So when deprecating browsers, just think a bit if, uh, ask yourself whether users are using something like Chrome um, because the site is unusable on other browsers. So if you base everything on your stats, you might have a look at Google Analytics and say, I'm going to deprecate i11. It's only 1% of users using it. Um, try to be careful with that. I've been working on a project that we were going to remove support for i11, and we tried out, and it turns out that it took 30 seconds to load. And that explains why we have so few page views from users. So if you, div if you deliver a crappy experience, then it's normal that you, your users won't use it so much. But then if you base your decisions on the analytics that you are getting, you are doing something wrong there. If we develop on Chrome and we, we believe that everyone is using Chrome and we always optimize for Chrome, then there's no wonder that the rest of browsers might be getting slow and slow at trying to run our code. And there are even weird corner cases uh, where optimization can lead to higher page load time. And I know this might not make sense, um, but yeah, it does. Um, I was reading this post called Webload uh, by, by Dan Lu. He says, he, he used to work at Google, and he says that while he was working there, there was a team that um, deployed an optimization for a website, and suddenly they saw the average page load time going up. And it turns out that lots of users with very slow network connections that couldn't use that project before, now they could access it. So suddenly you have more users, and yeah, those users are on slow connections, and that, that might make your page load time go up. But be careful with what you measure, because it might be that suddenly you're providing uh, you, your product to more people, even though some metrics might, might move in an unexpected way. So I think a better approach is to try to find out what people are buying and what people are using out there, not solely based on our stats. Then deliver a good experience on those devices. And then deprecate when needed. Like it based on browser usage, deprecate when a certain browser is not used so much. But try to base this on uh, global stats and not only your stats. The good thing about this is that when a user uses a high-end device, then suddenly they are getting a good experience. And this is uh, similar to a progressive enhancement approach. So if you make a good experience for low-end devices, and the people that have good ones or high-end ones, they will have a great experience. Second tip is uh, get familiar with the tech stack and not so much uh, with the library. When you hire people that are experts in a certain library, and your job description says, I want an expert on React or Vue or Angular, then you are going to get people that, I mean, there's a chance that those people will see that that's the only solution that they understand, and that fixes everything, and they will try to use it no matter what. And we need to ask other questions, like, do you know what happens when you load a website? Um, do you know what happens when you deliver a huge bundle to the user. So people that don't, they don't not only know about the internals of a tool, but they also know how to do code, code splitting or how to do server-side rendering. People that look at the whole stack. And it's important um, to learn about the whole stack because there are two constants that I see over and over again. If you don't challenge your company, then someone else is going to do it. Like, if you don't try to rebuild things in a better technology, then someone, some competitor, someone will come up 
They will create it from scratch with better tooling, and they will, they will win. So you need to foster this, and the only way is by having people that are that can abstract away from a library, and they can think in terms of these are the tools that I have at chance at reach, then I'm going to use them in a better way, regardless of the tool. The other constant is that tech changes. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started a project. We decided to use React. I'm pretty sure in a couple of years from now, if we were to choose the tech stack, it will look a bit different. The same way, maybe five years ago, I would have used Knockout, and 10 years ago, Vanilla JS. So tech is going to change. Only people who really understand the whole stack can try to optimize for uh, code deletion or for modularity, so you can uh, swap different pieces afterwards if you want to use a different UI library, but still keeping the business logic uh, separate. The third tip is to experiment and validate. I used to be one of those persons who shares lots of links with my colleagues. Uh, I would read some article on Medium or somewhere. I would watch some videos, and then I would share it. And I would say, yeah, guys, uh, folks, check this out. This is really interesting. And you think you are doing good, but sometimes people can feel the peer pressure that they need to go through that, and you are pushing more work to them, they might be busy working on other things, and they might not have the time for that. I think a better way is to go and try to apply it to a real project or part of your project, and then only say, this is how using this can really improve our project. I know it takes more time, it takes more effort, and lots of companies are problematic when asking for some time to, to try this out. But I think it's, it's worth it. Uh, you, if you try out something and it doesn't work, you don't share it with anyone. And there are so many tools that you look at them and they are like, oh, this is awesome. And maybe they are awesome for a Hello World example, but when you start working on them, you realize about lots of other problems. I think the same applies to sites like WPO Stats. This is a site that collects lots of case studies about performance. And it's very tempting to go and say, um, OK, it looks like rebuilding Pinterest pages for performance resulted in a 40% decrease in wait time. So you go to your boss or whoever is taking the decisions on what to work, and you tell them, uh, we need to make pages faster because it worked for Pinterest. But we don't really know what uh, users are doing on Pinterest, if there are any competitors. We don't know how slow, how bad pages were before this optimization. So chances are that your product owner, boss, whoever, is going to tell you, yeah, but that worked for them, but maybe, maybe it won't work for us. So again, it's way more useful to try to apply it to your project, and you get real numbers that you can, you can make a case on. And in the end, the idea is to come up with something, try it out, and then build it. The same way you should build a feature. Like Whenever someone tells you, uh, implement this feature, hopefully they have some hypothesis. They have tested that building that feature is going to move some metrics. I know that it doesn't always happen, but ideally, that has been proven. If you take one of, uh, sorry, if you take one of those um, ideas and you implement them, and you prove in a prototype that they really improve your project, then you can come up with that and say, we are going to build this because we proved that it can work. So try to, try to word it in the same way as someone else would word working on a new feature. My fourth tip is to share and celebrate success stories, uh, not only success stories, any stories about working on web performance. I really like uh, reading about Etsy. Etsy is an American company. Uh, it's a marketplace, and they've been talking about web performance for a long time. And I found some slides from 2011 sharing topics, same, pretty much the same topic I'm talking about right now. And they've been also posting about 
uh, how performance is going when they are making mistakes and suddenly a page is getting slower and slower. This is really good because you attract people. Suddenly I'm in the interested in working there because I know about web performance and I, I'm driven by this. Uh, at the same time, as a customer, I know that they really care about this. And then I will put my shop on their platform because I know that I'm not going to have any performance issues. The same way it works for positive, oh sorry, and they also had some dashboards where they would show, show off some of the performance improvements and they will give prizes to people that have been, have been driven those. The same way it works for positive, I think it works for negative. Uh, Vox Media is a big company that they have several websites. One of them is The Vert, which you might know. And three years ago, they, they, they posted about declaring performance bankruptcy. Basically, they, were, um, they, w they realized that the performance was really bad, and they shared it. And some of us, if we come across the same problem, we wouldn't share it out, out there, right? It's, it's scary. It's like telling your users, we suck. Uh, try to use some other platform. But it turns out this can be positive. It shows a real commitment that you are going to fix stuff. And by the way, I see that Smashing was super fast there. So also goes to Vitaly and, and his team. Vox Media started also posting about uh, performance updates in a very similar way to Etsy on how everything was going on. So do share. Um, whenever you win a small battle, do share it with other colleagues and get everyone excited about web performance and how we can move metrics. My fifth tip is to educate your colleagues. In our team, and in pretty much every team, we have this bus factor. And the idea is that you need to calculate how many people in your team can be hit by a bus and still be able to deliver your project. Or put it in another way, if I'm the only person who knows about web performance, then chances are that everything that I do, it won't be able, any, no one else within the team will be able to maintain or to improve if I'm the only one who understands that. It happens in everything. If you have a colleague that is super smart and they start doing some fancy code, okay, that's great, but they are the only one who understands it. So that's a red flag. And it might happen that you get hit by a bus, hopefully not, but you might go on parental leave, as I am, or you might change companies, you might change roles, you might get sick, etc., etc. So basically, if you come up with a fancy idea about how to improve performance but no one else understands it, then it won't get any traction. So you need to, you need to talk more with your colleagues and you need to teach them. The same applies to accessibility that we were talking before. So you need to try to avoid these kind of PRs that people remove code because no one understands. Just because John left the company several months ago, right? Um, this is, um, I made this up, but I have had these cases. That someone leaves and it's like, well, no one knows how to deal with this code. We need to simplify our code base. We are going to delete it. You don't want your performance improvements to fall into that. My sixth and last tip is make performance part of your workflow. It has to be super easy. If you go back to your team and tell them, yeah, we are going to fix performance by doing something like running a web page test every week manually, you are putting more effort on everyone, and that, that won't fly. You need to automate this. Uh, so web page tests, for instance, they have an API and you need to be using those kind of tools that can integrate very well within your workflow. And there are a myriad of tools. You can use something like GT metrics will also, that will also give you uh, some metrics and some timelines so you can detect when you deploy something that broke uh, performance. And you can use some uh, tools like Caliber. I really like this one because you can set performance budgets on pretty much any metric and then you can use their API to a console a PR, for instance, or to ping your own Slack. And this is super powerful because it doesn't really distract you. So you are only notified when something goes wrong. 
it happens close to when the code was released or even when the code was sent as a PR, and it's very easy to, to fix. So try to use this, these tools that you have at chance. Um, yeah, so just to wrap it up, my six tips, try to mimic the user's environment and know, learn a bit more about the tech stack. If you are really familiar with a certain library, make the effort of understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Experiment and validate and ask for the time to experiment. In the end, it's going to be good for your company. Um, some companies have hack days or hack weeks, hackathons. They have some time to to try to play with different libraries and different ideas. Ask for that if you don't have it. It's, it's really positive for the company. Share and celebrate. Talk about what you are working on and what results you got and get everyone excited. And even if the performance of your site is quite bad, talk about it, make a case for it, and make it, make it public. Educate your colleagues. You don't want to be the weak link that understands about these topics but then no one else understands about them. And the last one, make performance uh, part of your workflow. I've been writing about this. I published this a few days ago. It's a post that contains pretty much a, a long article about this talk with lots of links to different resources that you might find uh, interesting for, for web performance. So and that's all from me. Thank you very much. Hi, Costa, thank you. All right, let's have a talk, let's have a conversation. Um, it's, it's great, finally, performance. Performance, it's great. So I have tons of questions. I have tons of questions for you. Yeah. Um, now, when we, when we speak about performance, uh, I really like the fact that you mentioned that it's a good idea to make it visible, mm -hmm. so to have hackathons and things like that. This is why um, there are some companies that I know, at least, they just create a performance dashboard, yes. sort of like public monitor mm -hmm. that sits somewhere in the office, maybe at the entry point where you uh, see people coming in, and they map it against the conversion sometimes, if it's mm -hmm. an e-commerce site, for example. Just any way you can visualize performance actually really matters. I think it's, uh, it's really important to try to bind it to metrics that the rest of the company understands. So instead of saying, I can save two seconds of, my, of the load time, if you can say, I can move conversion 1%, yeah. suddenly there will be lots of people that will understand that and they will really see a value in the company because they can translate that into money. Yeah, that's so different. They it's like translating our language, I guess, in a way, in a business terms that could be then reused and to achieve certain goals. Yeah. Um, one thing that's interesting, I mean, we might have a dedicated team that takes care of performance. We might you know, be very proud of the code that we write. Mm -hmm. But I brought it up yesterday just because I'm a bit curious about your take on this. Uh, third party scripts. <laughs> so I mean, you can do <laughs> as much as you want in your performance culture and yes. monitor what's happening. But in the end, if you have even A-B testing scripts that are slightly a bit slower, you have add scripts, tracking pixels, all of this stuff. How can we bring them under control somehow? I mean, there is a business goal that has to yeah. be met. So performance, yeah, but we have a business requirement coming in. Yeah, of course, you want to enable the rest of the company to do their job. And if they need this tooling, you need somehow to, to provide it. You cannot say, no, I'm not going to add third-party scripts. But there are ways to do it. So in one of the projects that I, that I took over, we were using Google Tag Manager. And people around the company were adding more and more scripts for tracking things that maybe there were campaigns that lasted for one month, but then they, they forgot to remove those scripts. So what we did was to stop for a moment and then go through all the different scripts and figure out who wants it there, uh, until what date. And then, then what we did was removing that from Google Tag Manager. And, and then we would add them manually. But we would make sure that we were quite responsive. And whenever those teams had a need, we were able to solve that in a matter of hours or days, which I think is what they, what they are afraid of. Like They don't want to go to the development team, and then the development team tell them, yeah, that looks all right, but it will take us three weeks to implement. Like They want something immediately. 
if you can give that immediately, but at the same time get control of the tracking pixels and everything, I think that's a good balance. Well, I think at this point, Google Tag Manager should be forbidden by law. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many projects where so many uh, problems were introduced by just people bringing this stuff. And um, yeah, it's kind of a different story, I guess. I um, think it, it covers some needs, but the, the thing is that there's also the fact that sometimes you're working with different teams. They don't know what other teams are doing, what, m what things they are measuring. For instance, there are, there's a team uh, on Spotify using Optimizely for A-B testing. There are other teams that are using some uh, tools that maybe take the A-B test decision on the server, so you don't include the blocking script in the, in this, uh, in the start of the, of the page. So Sometimes it's about yeah, of talking course. a bit I mean, there's more. always a balance to find there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned measurements. So in terms of metrics, there are so many metrics, and it seems like every single year somebody comes up with a new metric that's now becoming the standard. Yes. And I guess you know, the best metric is probably the one that, you, that works really for you. The one, for example, in Pinterest case, it's the time you need to pin that image. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you recommend, what strategy would you recommend to get to your metric? Or like, what's the metric that, you, that you're using in Spotify? We use metrics like time to play. So from the moment you click on play until you get music. So we, we measure that. We also measure startup time of the, of the application or the web player. So that's also, of course, that's customized for the specific use case of Spotify. But you can also start with some general metrics like speed index or, um, I don't know, there are so many. Yeah, like there are so many. Like at Google I.O. they presented five of them, and they are now trying to figure out how to measure them automatically. But try, I think speed index is one of the best ones because it doesn't depend on your page load time so much. So you can put things, it won't, basically if you have a long running script that doesn't affect the rendering, it won't increase the page load time so much. So page speed is more, sorry, speed index is more based on what the user gets. Yeah, the perceived, uh, like the way. Yeah pixels rendered, like mm. useful pixels rendered, yeah. So I like um, that one. And what is actually the technical, like technology stack that you're using in Spotify? For um, measuring? For, uh, more for measuring, but I was also looking to just, just to build the application. I mean, you have it many applications. It depends, it depends on the project and when, pretty much when it started. As I was talking before, uh, sometimes we take the decisions based on the tech stack of the day or of the month. So there are projects that I use React and Redux, some older projects are using more vanilla or some in-house library. So I think these days we are moving more towards uh, React across the company, but in the end every team is uh, responsible for choosing their stack. So there might be teams that choose a different library because it's better for the use case. You also mentioned um, in your talk, you mentioned in terms of performance, we need to integrate performance somehow to make it visible in the hmm. workflow. And I think there are, there are a couple of really nice plugins uh, and just tools we can use to make sure that whenever we deploy, hmm. that there is always like a test running to then show you the speed index um, value that you have right now. I don't remember the tool, but uh, that's something just uh, came to my mind hmm. now. Um, yeah, we used to have lots of these tools that were about running and creating a performance report yep, manually. Exactly. But I think it's very important that we have a look at what APIs they provide and try to find ways to integrate it. Right. So for performance, everybody is talking about progressive web apps and service workers and mm. the huge advantages and boosts we can get with HTTP2. Mm. Uh, how many of you are actually running HTTP2? Not that many. Uh, how many of you are using service workers? A bit more. Or a bit sad. Maybe. <laughs> um, so what would you say, what has changed? I mean, HTTP2 is the thing. I think most, I think 70% of websites these days are running over HTTPS, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what, in terms of performance, what are some of the, let's say, good new best practices that emerge because of HTTP2, that kind of, and some of the old practices that become mm -hmm. anti-patterns these days? I think uh, we used to combine lots of JavaScript code and CSS code into one file to reduce the amount of requests. These days, that's a countermeasure. These days, we need to try to push whatever the user needs instead of sending a huge file. So I think we are working more towards that. And we, we have now ways to split these big bundles that were created 
using React and using all these single page application frameworks. So I think that's, that has been a quick win. And having code splitting with prefetching with HTTP2 is a really good setup. But as I said, one thing is what we learn in these conferences, and the other one is what you see in the projects out there. I think it's, it's still a bit difficult to go to an existing project and try to apply all of these. So I think it will take some time, especially for new projects, it's very easy. But for older projects, it's a bit difficult to. All right. But uh, would you say that every web app should be a progressive web app by default these days? Uh, yeah, why not? Like, I'm not a big friend of saying you should do it like this, you have to do it like that. I don't know. There are pages that are 20 years old and they still work fine and they, they do what they were supposed to do. So I would say create a website and try to make it as simple as possible. If adding progressive web apps means that you need to start with one of these boilerplate projects in which you don't understand anything that is going on and you are trapped into this tooling that you can't go away, then don't do a progressive web app. Uh, I think there's a danger of saying, these days, if you want to create a page, you need to do it like this and that and that. That's going to scare lots of people that are new to web development. I think I'm a big fan of old sites with a, like a basic editor where you put some HTML code and it just works. So just build something that works and try to make it simple. And whenever you are adding a lot of complexity, stop for a moment and wonder if it's, if it's worth it. I wouldn't say do progressive web apps, because I see lots of people that are imposing ideas and ways of working. And I think the web is free for everyone. Everyone can right click and see the source code, and they, they can create experiences. And that's how pretty much every one right. of us has has been learning. What well, as long as it's see. fast, then I guess that's OK. That's the most important thing. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for being here, Jose. Thanks to you. Thanks.